In the oldest texts of Buddhism, dhyana Sanskrit or jhana Pali is a series of cultivated states of mind, commonly translated as meditation, which lead to a state of perfect equanimity and awareness Dhyana may have been the core practice of pre-sectarian Buddhism, together with several preceding practices which lead to calm and detachment, and are fully realized with th practice of dhyana. In the later commentarial tradition, which has survived in present-day Theravada, dhyana is equated with concentration, a state of one-pointed absorption in which there is a diminished awareness of the surroundings. In the contemporary Theravada-based vipassana movement, this absorbed state of mind is regarded as unnecessary and even non-beneficial for awakening, which has to be reached by mindfulness of the body and vipassana insight into impermanence. Since the 1980s, scholars and practitioners have started to question this equation, arguing for a more comprehensive and integrated understanding and approach, based on the oldest descriptions of dhyana in the suttas. In Chan and Zen, the Chinese and Japanese renderings of dhyana, dhyana is the central practice, which is ultimately based on Sarvastivada meditation practices, and has been transmitted since the beginning of the Common Era. Etymology <inaudible> 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 Dhyana is commonly translated as meditation, and is often equated with concentration, though meditation may refer to a wider scala of exercises for bhavana, development. Dhyana can also mean attention, thought, refulction. According to Buddhaghosa, the term jhana skt, dhyana, is derived from the verb jayati, to think or meditate, while the verb japeti, to burn up explicates its function, namely burning up opposing states, burning up or destroying the mental defilements preventing the development of serenity and insight. The jhanas The Pali Canon describes four progressive states of jhana called rupa jhana, form jhana and four additional meditative states called arupa without form. Topic. Preparatory practices Meditation and contemplation are preceded by preparatory practices, which are fully realized with the practice of dhyana. As described in the Noble Eightfold Path, right view leads to leaving the household life and becoming a wandering monk. Sila morality comprises the rules for right conduct. Right effort, C, Q, the four right efforts, aim to prevent the arising of unwholesome states, and to generate wholesome states. This includes indriya samvara sense restraint, controlling the response to sensual perceptions, not giving in to lust and aversion but simply noticing the objects of perception as they appear. Right effort and mindfulness calm the mind-body complex, releasing unwholesome states and habitual patterns, and encouraging the development of wholesome states and non-automatic responses. By following these cumulative steps and practices, the mind becomes set, almost naturally, for the practice of dhyana. The practice of dhyana reinforces the development of wholesome states, leading to upekka equanimity and mindfulness. Topic: The rupa jhanas. Topic: Qualities of the rupa jhanas. The practice of dhyana is aided by anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing. The Suttapitaka and the Agamas describe four stages of rupa jhana. Rupa refers to the material realm, in a neutral stance, as different form the Kama realm lust, desire, and the Arupa realm, non realm Each jhana is characterized by a set of qualities which are present in that jhana. First dhyana, the first dhyana can be entered when one is secluded from sensuality and unskillful qualities, due to withdrawal and right effort. There is pity, rapture, and non-sensual sukha, pleasure. As the result of seclusion, while Vitarka Vikara, discursive thought, continues. Second dhyana, there is pity, rapture, and non-sensual sukha, pleasure, as the result of concentration, samadhi g, born of samadhi, ekagata, unification of awareness, free from Vitarka Vikara, discursive thought, sampasadana, inner tranquility. Third dhyana, upekka, equanimous, effective detachment. Mindful, and alert, and senses pleasure with the body. Fourth dhyana, upekasadaparasuddhi, purity of equanimity and mindfulness, neither pleasure nor pain. 
Traditionally, the fourth jhana is seen as the beginning of attaining psychic powers Interpretation of the four dhyanas While the jhanas are often understood as deepening states of concentration, due to its description as such in the Abhidhamma, and the Visuddhimagga, since the 1980s scholars and modern Theravadins have started to question this understanding. Roderick S. Bucknell notes that Vitarka and Vikara may refer to probably nothing other than the normal process of discursive thought, the familiar but usually unnoticed stream of mental imagery and verbalization." Bucknell further notes that, t -h -e -s -e conclusions conflict with the widespread conception of the first jhana as a state of deep concentration." According to Stuart Fox, the Abhidhamma separated Vitarka from Vikara, and Ekagata was added to the description first dhyana to give an equal number of five hindrances and five antidotes. The commentarial tradition regards the kalitis of the first dhyana to be antidotes to the five hindrances, and Ekagata may have been added to the first dhyana to give exactly five antidotes for the five hindrances. Stuart Fox further notes that Vitarka, being discursive thought, will do very little as an antidote for sloth and torpor, reflecting the inconsistencies which were introduced by the scholastics. Vedder, Gombrich, and Wynne note that the first and second jhana represent the onset of dhyana due to withdrawal and right effort c. q. the four right efforts, followed by concentration, whereas the third and fourth jhana combine concentration with mindfulness. Pollock, elaborating on Vedder, notes that the onset of the first dhyana is described as a quite natural process, due to the preceding efforts to restrain the senses and the nurturing of wholesome states. Regarding samadhi as the eighth step of the Noble Eightfold Path, Vedder notes that samadhi consists of the four stages of dhyana meditation, but to put it more accurately, the first dhyana seems to provide, after some time, a state of strong concentration, from which the other stages come forth. The second stage is called samadhiya. Born from samadhi. According to Richard Gombrich, the sequence of the four rupa jhanas describes two different cognitive states. I know this is controversial, but it seems to me that the third and fourth jhanas are thus quite unlike the second. Gombrich and Wynne note that, while the second jhana denotes a state of absorption, in the third and fourth jhana one comes out of this absorption, being mindfully awareness of objects while being indifferent to it. According to Gombrich, the later tradition has falsified the jhana by classifying them as the quintessence of the concentrated, calming kind of meditation, ignoring the other, and indeed higher, element, gethin, followed by Pollock and Arbel, further notes that there is a definite affinity between the four jhanas and the bojhanga, the seven factors of awakening. According to Gethin, the early Buddhist texts have a broadly consistent vision. Regarding meditation practice, various practices lead to the development of the factors of awakening, which are not only the means to, but also the constituents of awakening. According to Gethin, Satipatthana and Anapanasati are related to a formula that summarizes the Buddhist path to awakening as abandoning the hindrances, establishing mindfulness, and developing the seven factors of awakening. Quote, this results in a heightened awareness, quote, quote, overcoming distracting and disturbing emotions which are not particular elements of the path to awakening, but rather common disturbing and distracting emotions." Gethin further states that, the exegetical literature is essentially true to the vision of meditation presented in the Nikayas, applying the perfect mindfulness, stillness and lucidity of the jhanas to the contemplation of reality, of the way things really are, as temporary and ever-changing. It is in this sense that, the jhana state has the transcendent, transforming quality of awakening. Upekka, equanimity, which is perfected in the fourth dhyana, is one of the four Brahma Vihara. While the commentarial tradition downplayed the importance of the Brahma Vihara, Gombrich notes that the Buddhist usage of the Brahma Vihara originally referred to an awakened state of mind, and a concrete attitude toward other beings which was equal to living with Brahman, here and now. The later tradition took those descriptions too literally, linking them to cosmology and understanding them as living with Brahman, by rebirth in the Brahma world. According to Gombrich, 
The Buddha taught that kindness, what Christians tend to call love, was a way to salvation. Alexander Wynne states that the dhyana scheme is poorly understood. According to Wynne, words expressing the inculcation of awareness, such as sati, sampahano, and upekka, are mistranslated or understood as particular factors of meditative states, whereas they refer to a particular way of perceiving the sense objects. Thus the expression sato sampahano in the third jhana must denote a state of awareness different from the meditative absorption of the second jhana it suggests that the subject is doing something different from remaining in a meditative state, i.e. that he has come out of his absorption and is now once again aware of objects. The same is true of the word upik k ha. it does not denote an abstract equanimity, but it means to be aware of something and indifferent to it. Closing square bracket. The third and fourth jhana s, as it seems to me, describe the process of directing states of meditative absorption towards the mindful awareness of objects. Thanissaro Bhikkhu, a Western teacher in the Thai forest tradition, argues that the Visuddhimagga deviates from the Pali canon in its description of the jhanas, and warns against the development of strong states of concentration. Arbal describes the fourth jhana as, "...non-reactive and lucid awareness", not as a state of deep concentration. The Arupas Grouped into the jhana scheme are four meditative states, referred to in the early texts as arapas. These are also referred to in commentarial literature as immaterial, formless jhanas also translated as the formless dimensions, in distinction from the first four jhanas In the Buddhist canonical texts, the word jhana is never explicitly used to denote them, they are instead referred to as ayatana. However, they are sometimes mentioned in sequence after the first four jhanas other texts. EGMN 121 treat them as a distinct set of attainments and thus came to be treated by later exegetes as jhanas. The immaterial are related to, or derived from, yogic meditation, while the jhanas proper are related to the cultivation of the mind. The state of complete dwelling in emptiness is reached when the eighth jhana is transcended. The four arupas are, Fifth jhana, infinite space, Pali Akasanankayatana, skt. Akasanankayatana. Sixth jhana, infinite consciousness, Pali Vijnanankayatana, skt. Vijnananantayatana. Seventh jhana, infinite nothingness, Pali Akimkanyayatana, skt. Akimkanyayatana. Eighth jhana, neither perception nor non-perception, Pali Nevasanyanasanyayatana, skt. Naivasamyanasamyayatana. Although the dimension of nothingness", and the dimension of neither perception nor non-perception", are included in the list of nine jhanas taught by the Buddha, they are not included in the Noble Eightfold Path. Noble Path number eight is, Sama Samadhi, right concentration, and only the first four jhanas are considered, right concentration. If he takes a disciple through all the jhanas, the emphasis is on the, cessation of feelings and perceptions, rather than stopping short at the, Dimension of neither perception nor non-perception. Naroda Samapati Beyond the dimension of neither perception nor non-perception lies a state called Naroda Samapati, the cessation of perception, feelings and consciousness. Only in commentarial and scholarly literature this sometimes is called the ninth jhana. Topic. Origins The time of the Buddha saw the rise of the Sramana movement, ascetic practitioners with a body of shared teachings and practices. The strict delineation of this movement into Jainism, Buddhism and Brahmanical, Upanishadic traditions is a later development. Topic invention or incorporation According to Bronckhorst, the practice of the four dhyanas may have been an original contribution by Gautama Buddha to the religious practices of ancient India in response to the ascetic practices of the Jains. Kalupahana argues that the Buddha reverted to the meditational practices he had learned from Arata Kalama and Yudhika Ramaputta. Wynne argues that Arata Kalama and Yudhika Ramaputta were Brahmanical teachers, and that the attainment of the formless meditative absorption was incorporated from Brahmanical practices. These practices were paired to mindfulness and insight, and given a new interpretation. The stratification of particular samadhi experiences into the four jhanas seems to be a Buddhist innovation. 
It was then borrowed and presented in an incomplete form in the Moksadharma, a part of the Mahabharata. Thomas William Rhys Davids and Maurice Walsh agreed that the term samadhi is not found in any pre Buddhist text but is first mentioned in the Tipit aka. It was later incorporated into later texts such as the Maitrayaniya Upanishad. But according to Matsumoto, the terms dhyana and samahita entering samadhi appear already in Upanishadic texts that predate the origins of Buddhism. Topic Buddhist origins The Mahasakaka Sutta, Majjhima Nikaya 36, narrates the story of the Buddha's awakening. According to this story, he learned two kinds of meditation, which did not lead to enlightenment. He then underwent harsh ascetic practices with which he eventually also became disillusioned. The Buddha then recalled a meditative state he entered by chance as a child. I thought, I recall once, when my father the Sakyan was working, and I was sitting in the cool shade of a rose apple tree, then, quite secluded from sensuality, secluded from unskillful mental qualities, I entered and remained in the first jhana, rapture and pleasure born from seclusion, accompanied by directed thought and evaluation. Could that be the path to awakening? Then following on that memory came the realization, that is the path to awakening. Originally the practice of dhyana itself may have constituted the core liberating practice of early Buddhism, since in this state all pleasure and pain had waned. According to Vedder, p. probably the word immortality amata was used by the Buddha for the first interpretation of this experience and not the term cessation of suffering that belongs to the Four Noble Truths. The Buddha did not achieve the experience of salvation by discerning the Four Noble Truths and or other data. But his experience must have been of such a nature that it could bear the interpretation achieving immortality. Topic Brahmanical influences Alexander Wynne attempted to find parallels in Brahmanical texts to the meditative goals the two teachers claimed to have taught, drawing especially on some of the Upanishads and the Mokshadharma chapter of the Mahabharata. Topic Yudhika Ramaputta and Alara Kalama The suttas describe how the Buddha learned meditative practices from two teachers, Yudhika Ramaputta and Alara Kalama. Alex Wynne argues that Yudhika Ramaputta belonged to the pre-Buddhist tradition portrayed by the Buddhist and Brahmanic sources, in which the philosophical formulations of the early Upanishads were accepted, and the meditative state of neither perception nor non-perception was equated with the self. Wynne further argues that the goal of Alara Kalama was a Brahmanical concept. Evidence in the Chandogya Upanishad and the Taittiriya Upanishad suggests that a different early Brahmanic philosophical tradition held the view that the unmanifest state of Brahman was a form of non-existence. According to Wynne it thus seems likely that both element and formless meditation was learned by the Buddha from his two teachers, and adapted by him to his own system. <laughs> Brahmanical practices Formless spheres It appears that in early Brahmanic yoga, the formless spheres were attained following element meditation. This is also taught as an option in the early Buddhist texts. The primary method taught to achieve the formless attainment in early Buddhist scriptures, on the other hand, is to proceed to the sphere of infinite space following the fourth jhana. Topic. Reversal of the creation of the world Wynne claimed that Brahmanic passages on meditation suggest that the most basic presupposition of early Brahmanical yoga is that the creation of the world must be reversed, through a series of meditative states, by the yogin who seeks the realization of the self. These states were given doctrinal background in early Brahmanic cosmologies, which classified the world into successively coarser strata. One such stratification is found at 2.2.1 and MBH 12.195, and proceeds as follows, self, space, wind, fire, water, earth. MBH 12.224 gives alternatively, Brahman, mind, space, wind, fire, water, earth. In Brahmanical thought, the meditative states of consciousness were thought to be identical to the subtle strata of the cosmos. There is no similar theoretical background to element meditation in the early Buddhist texts, where the elements appear simply as suitable objects of meditation. It is likely that the Brahmanic practices of element meditation were borrowed and adapted by early Buddhists, with the original Brahmanic ideology of the practices being discarded in the process. Topic. Investigation of self on this point, it is thought that the uses of the elements in early Buddhist literature have in general very little connection to Brahmanical thought, in most places they occur in teachings where they form the objects of a detailed contemplation of the human being. 
The aim of these contemplations seems to have been to bring about the correct understanding that the various perceived aspects of a human being, when taken together, nevertheless do not comprise a self. Moreover, the self is conceptualized in terms similar to both nothingness and neither perception nor non perception. At different places in early Upanishadic literature, the latter corresponds to Yajnavakya's definition of the self in his famous dialogue with Maitreyi in the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad and the definition given in the post Buddhist Mandukya Upanishad. This is mentioned as a claim of non Buddhist ascetics and Brahmins in the Pankataya Sutta. Majjima Nikaya in the same dialogue in the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, Yajnavakya draws the conclusions that the self that is neither perceptive nor non-perceptive is a state of consciousness without object. The early Buddhist evidence suggests much the same thing for the state of neither perception nor non-perception. It is a state without an object of awareness, that is not devoid of awareness. The state following it in the Buddhist scheme, the cessation of perception and sensation is devoid not only of objectivity, but of subjectivity as well. Topic. Criticism of Wynne The Brahmanical texts cited by Wynne assumed their final form long after the Buddha's lifetime. The Mokshadharma postdates him. Topic. Early Buddhism The Buddhist tradition has incorporated two traditions regarding the use of jhana. There is a tradition that stresses attaining insight bodhi, prajna, kensho, as the means to awakening and liberation. But the Buddhist tradition has also incorporated the yogic tradition, as reflected in the use of jhana, which is rejected in other sutras as not resulting in the final result of liberation. One solution to this contradiction is the conjunctive use of vipassana and samatha. Topic. Five possibilities regarding jhana and liberation Schmidhausen notes that the mention of the Four Noble Truths as constituting liberating insight, which is attained after mastering the rupa jhanas, is a later addition to texts such as Majjhima Nikaya 36. Schmidhausen discerns three possible roads to liberation as described in the suttas, to which Vedder adds a fourth possibility, while the attainment of Naroda Samapati may constitute a fifth possibility. Mastering the four jhanas, whereafter, liberating insight, is attained. Mastering the four jhanas and the four arupas, whereafter, liberating insight, is attained. Liberating insight itself suffices. The four jhanas themselves constituted the core liberating practice of early Buddhism, c. q. the Buddha. Liberation is attained in Naroda Samapati. Topic. Rupa jhana followed by liberating insight. According to the Theravada tradition, the meditator uses the jhana state to bring the mind to rest, and to strengthen and sharpen the mind, in order to investigate the true nature of phenomena dhamma, and to gain insight into impermanence, suffering and not-self. According to the Theravada tradition, the arahant is aware that the jhanas are ultimately unsatisfactory, realizing that the meditative attainments are also anicca, impermanent. In the Mahasakaka Sutta, Majjhima Nikaya 36, which narrates the story of the Buddha's awakening, dhyana is followed by insight into the Four Noble Truths. The mention of the Four Noble Truths as constituting liberating insight is probably a later addition. Vedder notes that such insight is not possible in a state of dhyana, when interpreted as concentration, since discursive thinking is eliminated in such a state. He also notes that the emphasis on liberating insight developed only after the Four Noble Truths were introduced as an expression of what this liberating insight constituted. In time, other expressions took over this function, such as pratityasamutpada and the emptiness of the self. Topic. Rupa jhana and the arupas, followed by liberating insight. This scheme is rejected by scholars as a later development, since the arupas are akin to non-Buddhist practices, and rejected elsewhere in the canon. Topic. Insight alone suffices. The emphasis on liberating insight alone seems to be a later development, in response to developments in Indian religious thought, which saw liberating insight as essential to liberation. 
This may also have been due to an over-literal interpretation by later scholastics of the terminology used by the Buddha, and to the problems involved with the practice of dhyana, and the need to develop an easier method. Contemporary scholars have discerned a broader application of jhana in historical Buddhist practice. According to Alexander Wynne, the ultimate aim of dhyana was the attainment of insight, and the application of the meditative state to the practice of mindfulness. According to Frau Wallner, mindfulness was a means to prevent the arising of craving, which resulted simply from contact between the senses and their objects. According to Frau Wallner, this may have been the Buddha's original idea. According to Wynne, this stress on mindfulness may have led to the intellectualism which favored insight over the practice of dhyana. Topic. Jhana itself is liberating. Both Schmidthausen and Bronckhorst note that the attainment of insight, which is a cognitive activity, can't be possible in a state wherein all cognitive acidity has ceased. According to Vedder, the practice of rupa jhana itself may have constituted the core practice of early Buddhism, with practices such as sila and mindfulness aiding to its development. It is the middle way between self-mortification, ascribed by Bronckhorst to Jainism, and indulgence in sensual pleasure. Vedder emphasizes that dhyana is a form of non-sensual happiness. The Eightfold Path can be seen as a path of preparation which leads to the practice of samadhi. Topic. Liberation in Naroda Samapati According to some texts, after progressing through the eight jhanas and the stage of Naroda Samapati, a person is liberated. According to some traditions someone attaining the state of Naroda Samapati is an anagami or an arahant. In the Anupada Sutra, the Buddha narrates that Sariputta became an arahant upon reaching it. Theravada Dhyana is concentration Buddhaghosa's Visuddhimagga considers jhana to be an exercise in concentration meditation. His views, together with the Satipatthana Sutta, inspired the development, in the 19th and 20th century, of new meditation techniques which gained a great popularity among lay audiences in the second half of the 20th century. <laughs> Samadhi According to Henapula Gunaratana, the term, jhana, is closely connected with samadhi, which is generally rendered as concentration. The word samadhi is almost interchangeable with the word samatha, serenity. According to Gunaratana, in the widest sense the word samadhi is being used for the practices which lead to the development of serenity. In this sense, samadhi and jhana are close in meaning. Nevertheless, they are not exactly identical, since Certain differences in their suggested and contextual meanings prevent unqualified identification of the two terms. Samadhi signifies only one mental factor, namely one pointedness, while the word jhana encompasses the whole state of consciousness, or at least the whole group of mental factors individuating that meditative state as a jhana. Furthermore, according to Gunaratana, samadhi involves a wider range of reference than jhana. Noting that, the Pali exegetical tradition recognizes three levels of samadhi, preliminary concentration samadhi, access concentration samadhi, and absorption concentration samadhi. Topic. Development and application of concentration According to the Pali Canon Commentary, access, neighborhood concentration is a stage of meditation that the meditator reaches before entering into jhana. The overcoming of the five hindrances mark the entry into access concentration. Access concentration is not mentioned in the discourses of the Buddha, but there are several suttas where a person gains insight into the Dhamma on hearing a teaching from the Buddha. According to Zhe Fu Quan, at the state of access concentration, some meditators may experience vivid mental imagery, which is similar to a vivid dream. They are as vivid as if seen by the eye, but in this case the meditator is fully aware and conscious that they are seeing mental images. 
According to Zhe Fu Quan, this is discussed in the early texts, and expanded upon in Theravada commentaries. According to Venerable Sujivo, as the concentration becomes stronger, the feelings of breathing and of having a physical body will completely disappear, leaving only pure awareness. At this stage, inexperienced meditators may become afraid, thinking that they are going to die if they continue the concentration, because the feeling of breathing and the feeling of having a physical body has completely disappeared. They should not be so afraid and should continue their concentration in order to reach full concentration. Jhana, a meditator should first master the lower jhanas, before they can go into the higher jhanas. According to Nathan Katz, the early suttas state that the most exquisite of recluses is able to attain any of the jhanas and abide in them without difficulty. According to the contemporary vipassana movement, the jhana state cannot by itself lead to enlightenment as it only suppresses the defilements. Meditators must use the jhana state as an instrument for developing wisdom by cultivating insight, and use it to penetrate the true nature of phenomena through direct cognition, which will lead to cutting off the defilements and nibbana. According to the later Theravada commentorial tradition as outlined by Buddhaghosa in his Visuddhimagga, after coming out of the state of jhana the meditator will be in the state of post-jhana access concentration. In this state the investigation and analysis of the true nature of phenomena begins, which leads to insight into the characteristics of impermanence, suffering and not-self arises. Topic. Contemporary reassessment The Jhana Wars While Theravada meditation was introduced to the West as vipassana meditation, which rejected the usefulness of jhana, there is a growing interest among Western vipassana practitioners in jhana. The nature and practice of jhana is a topic of debate and contentment among Western convert Theravadins, to the extent that the disputes have even been called the jhana wars. Both academic scholars and contemporary practitioners have raised questions about the interpretation of the jhanas as being states of absorption which are not necessary for the attainment of liberation. While groundbreaking research on this topic has been done by Barrow, Schmidhausen, Stuart Fox, Bucknell, Vetter, Bronkhorst, and Wynn, Theravada practitioners have also scrutinized and criticized the Samatha Vipassana distinction. Reassessments of the description of jhana in the suttas consider jhana and vipassana to be an integrated practice, leading to a tranquil and economous awareness of whatever arises in the field of experience. Topic: <coughs> <coughs> Criticism of Visuddhimagga. The Visuddhimagga and the pioneering popularizing work of Daniel Goleman has been influential in the Miz understanding of dhyana being a form of concentration meditation. The Visuddhimagga is centered around kasina meditation, a form of concentration meditation in which the mind is focused on a mental object. According to Thanissaro Bhikkhu, t he text then tries to fit all other meditation methods into the mold of kasina practice, so that they too give rise to countersigns, but even by its own admission, breath meditation does not fit well into the mold. According to Thanissaro Bhikkhu, the Visuddhimagga uses a very different paradigm for concentration from what you find in the canon. In its emphasis on kasina meditation, the Visuddhimagga departs from the Pali canon, in which dhyana is the central meditative practice, indicating that what jhana means in the commentaries is something quite different from what it means in the canon. Bhante Henapola Gunaratana also notes that what the suttas say is not the same as what the Visuddhimagga says. They are actually different, leading to a divergence between a traditional scholarly understanding and a practical understanding based on meditative experience. Gunaratana further notes that Buddhaghosa invented several key meditation terms which are not to be found in the suttas, such as parakama samadhi (preparatory concentration), upakara samadhi (access concentration), apanasamadhi (absorption concentration). Gunaratana also notes that the Buddhaghosa's emphasis on kasina meditation is not to be found in the suttas, where dhyana is always combined with mindfulness. According to Vedder, dhyana as a preparation of discriminating insight must have been different from the dhyana practice introduced by the Buddha, using kasina exercises to produce a more artificially produced dhyana, resulting in the cessation of apperceptions and feelings. Kasina exercises are propagated in Buddhaghosa's Visuddhimagga, which is considered the authoritative commentary on meditation practice in the Theravada tradition, but differs from the Pali canon in its description of jhana. 
While the suttas connect samadhi to mindfulness and awareness of the body, for buddhaghosa jhana is a purely mental exercise, in which one-pointed concentration leads to a narrowing of attention. <laughs> jhana as integrated practice Several Western teachers Thanissaro Bhikkhu, Lee Brasington, Richard Shankman make a distinction between sutta-oriented jhana and visuddhimagga-oriented jhana, dubbed minimalists and mamalists. By Kenneth Rose, Thanissaro Bhikkhu has repeatedly argued that the Pali Canon and the Visuddhimagga give different descriptions of the jhanas, regarding the Visuddhimagga discretion to be incorrect. According to Richard Shankman, the Sutta descriptions of jhana practice explain that the meditator does not emerge from jhana to practice vipassana but rather the work of insight is done whilst in jhana itself. In particular, the meditator is instructed to enter and remain in the fourth jhana. Before commencing the work of insight in order to uproot the mental defilements, Karen Arbel has conducted extensive research on the jhanas and the contemporary criticisms of the commentarial interpretation. Based on this research, and her own experience as a senior meditation teacher, she gives a reconstructed account of the original meaning of the dhyanas. She argues that jhana is an integrated practice, describing the fourth jhana as non-reactive and lucid awareness, not as a state of deep concentration. According to Arbel, it develops a mind which is not conditioned by habitual reaction patterns of likes and dislikes, a profoundly wise relation to experience, not tainted by any kind of wrong perception and mental reactivity rooted in craving tana. According to Kenneth Rose, the Visuddhimagga-oriented maximalist approach is a return to ancient Indian mainstream practices, in which physical and mental immobility was thought to lead to liberation from samsara and rebirth. This approach was rejected by the Buddha, turning to a Gentler approach which results in upekkha and sati, equanimous awareness of experience. In Mahayana traditions Mahayana Buddhism includes numerous schools of practice. Each draw upon various Buddhist sutras, philosophical treatises, and commentaries, and each has its own emphasis, mode of expression, and philosophical outlook. Accordingly, each school has its own meditation methods for the purpose of developing samadhi and prajna, with the goal of ultimately attaining enlightenment. Topic. Chan Buddhism Dhyana is a central aspect of Buddhist practice in Chan, necessary for progress on the path and true entry into the Dharma. Topic. Origins. In China, the word Diana was originally transliterated with Chinese, Chan na pinyin, Chana and shortened to just pinyin, Chan in common usage. The word and the practice of meditation entered into Chinese through the translations of An Shigao, Florida, c. 148-180 CE, and Kumarajiva 334-413 CE, who translated Dhyana Sutras, which were influential early meditation texts mostly based on the Yogacara meditation teachings of the Sarvastivada school of Kashmir circa 1st-4th centuries CE. The word Chan became the designation for Chan Buddhism Korean Son, Zen. While dhyana in a strict sense refers to the four dhyanas, in Chinese Buddhism dhyana may refer to various kinds of meditation techniques and their preparatory practices, which are necessary to practice dhyana. The five main types of meditation in the Dhyana Sutras are Anapanasati mindfulness of breathing, Patikalamanasikara meditation, mindfulness of the impurities of the body, loving-kindness Maitri meditation, the contemplation on the twelve links of Pratityasamutpada, and the contemplation on the Buddha's thirty-two characteristics. <laughs> mindfulness <laughs> Observing the breath during sitting meditation, practitioners usually assume a position such as the lotus position, half lotus, Burmese, or yoga postures, using the dhyana mudra. To regulate the mind, awareness is directed towards counting or watching the breath or by bringing that awareness to the energy center below the navel see also Anapanasati. Often, a square or round cushion placed on a padded mat is used to sit on, in some other cases, a chair may be used. This practice may simply be called sitting dhyana, which is zuokan zuo chan in Chinese, and zazen zuo chan in Japanese, jawasian zuo chan in Korean. Topic: 
observing the mind. In the Soto school of Zen, meditation with no objects, anchors, or content, is the primary form of practice. The meditator strives to be aware of the stream of thoughts, allowing them to arise and pass away without interference. Considerable textual, philosophical, and phenomenological justification of this practice can be found throughout Dogen's Shobhagenzo, as for example in the Principles of Zazen and the Universally Recommended Instructions for Zazen. In the Japanese language, this practice is called shikantaza. Topic: <inaudible> Insight. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Pointing to the nature of the mind. According to Charles Luck, in the earliest traditions of Chan, there was no fixed method or formula for teaching meditation, and all instructions were simply heuristic methods to point to the true nature of the mind, also known as Buddha nature. According to Luck, this method is referred to as the mind dharma, and exemplified in the story of Sakyamuni Buddha holding up a flower silently, and Mahakasyapa smiling as he understood. A traditional formula of this is, Chan points directly to the human mind, to enable people to see their true nature and become Buddhas. Topic. Koan practice at the beginning of the Song dynasty, practice with the koan method became popular, whereas others practiced silent illumination. This became the source of some differences in practice between the Linji and Kaodong schools. A koan, literally, public case, is a story or dialogue, describing an interaction between a Zen master and a student. These anecdotes give a demonstration of the master's insight. Koans emphasize the non conceptional insight that the Buddhist teachings are pointing to. Koans can be used to provoke the great doubt and test a student's progress in Zen practice. Koan inquiry may be practiced during zazen, sitting meditation, kinhen, walking meditation, and throughout all the activities of daily life. Koan practice is particularly emphasized by the Japanese Rinzai school, but it also occurs in other schools or branches of Zen depending on the teaching line. The Zen student's mastery of a given koan is presented to the teacher in a private interview, referred to in Japanese as dokusen, dukendaisen, daikin, or sanzen. While there is no unique answer to a koan, practitioners are expected to demonstrate their understanding of the koan and of Zen through their responses. The teacher may approve or disapprove of the answer and guide the student in the right direction. The interaction with a Zen teacher is central in Zen, but makes Zen practice also vulnerable to misunderstanding and exploitation. Topic. Vajrayana B. Alan Wallace holds that modern Tibetan Buddhism lacks emphasis on achieving levels of concentration higher than access concentration. According to Wallace, one possible explanation for this situation is that virtually all Tibetan Buddhist meditators seek to become enlightened through the use of tantric practices. These require the presence of sense desire and passion in one's consciousness, but jhana effectively inhibits these phenomena, while few Tibetan Buddhists, either inside or outside Tibet, devote themselves to the practice of concentration. Tibetan Buddhist literature does provide extensive instructions on it, and great Tibetan meditators of earlier times stressed its importance. Topic. Related concepts in Indian religions Dhyana is an important ancient practice mentioned in the Vedic and post-Vedic literature of Hinduism, as well as early texts of Jainism. Dhyana in Buddhism influenced these practices as well as was influenced by them, likely in its origins and its later development. Topic. Parallels with Patanjali's Ashtanga Yoga There are parallels with the fourth to eighth stages of Patanjali's Ashtanga Yoga, as mentioned in his classical work, Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, which were compiled around 400 CE by, taking materials about yoga from older traditions, Patanjali discerns bahiranga external aspects of yoga namely, yama, niyama, asana, pranayama, and the antaranga internal yoga. Having actualized the pratyahara stage, a practitioner is able to effectively engage into the practice of samyama. 
At the stage of pratyahara, the consciousness of the individual is internalized in order that the sensations from the senses of taste, touch, sight, hearing and smell don't reach their respective centers in the brain and takes the sadhaka practitioner to next stages of yoga, namely dharana concentration, dhyana meditation, and samadhi mystical absorption, being the aim of all yogic practices. The eight limbs of the Yoga Sutras show samadhi as one of its limbs. The eight limbs of the Yoga Sutra was influenced by Buddhism. Vyasa's Yogabhashya, the commentary to the Yoga Sutras, and Vikaspati Misra's subcommentary state directly that the samadhi techniques are directly borrowed from the Buddhist's jhana, with the addition of the mystical and divine interpretations of mental absorption. However, it is also to be noted that the Yoga Sutra, especially the fourth segment of Kaivalya Pada, contains several polemical verses critical of Buddhism, particularly the Vijñanavada school of Vasubandhu. The suttas show that during the time of the Buddha, Nigantha Nataputta, the Jain leader, did not even believe that it is possible to enter a state where the thoughts and examination stop. Topic scientific studies There has been little scientific study of these mental states. In 2008, an EEG study found strong, significant, and consistent differences in specific brain regions when the meditator is in a jhana state compared to normal resting consciousness. Tentative hypotheses on the neurological correlates have been proposed, but lack supporting evidence. Topic see also Research on meditation Neuroplasticity Altered state of consciousness Jnana topic Notes topic References topic Sources topic Further reading Scholarly Philological, Historical Stuart Fox, Martin 1989, Jhana and Buddhist Scholasticism, Journal of the International Association of Buddhist Studies, Volume 12, 1988, Number 2 Bucknell, Robert South 1993, Reinterpreting the Jhanas, Journal of the International Association of Buddhist Studies, Volume 16 Number 2, Winter 1993 Bronkhorst, Johannes 1993, The Two Traditions of Meditation in Ancient India, Mudalal Banarsidas Publ. Vedder, Tillman 1988, The Ideas and Meditative Practices of Early Buddhism, Brill Wynn, Alexander 2007, The Origin of Buddhist Meditation, Routledge Polak Re-examining Jhana Analayo 2017, Early Buddhist Meditation Studies Defense of Traditional Theravada Position Reassessment of Jhana in Theravadically, Natalie 2008, Multiple Buddhist Modernisms, Jhana in Convert Theravada PDF, Pacific World 10-225-200 149 Shankman 2008, The Experience of Samadhi Karen Arbel 2017, Early Buddhist Meditation, Taylor and Francis Topic External links Sutras Jhana 2005, Descriptions and Similes from the Pali Canons Angatara Nikaya and Dhammapada, by John T. Bullitt, Jhana Wars Lee Brighton, Interpretations of the Jhanas Jhana Wars, Simple, Suttas Sutta Style Jhanas, A Western Phenomenon, Dhamma Wheel Western Theravada Visuddhimagga Oriented A John Brahmavamso, Travelogue to the the Four Jhanas Ajahn Brahmavamso, the Jhanas Western Theravada Sutta oriented Thanissaro Bhikkhut, Jhana not by the numbers Bhanti Vimalaramsi Mahathera, MN 111 1 by 1 as they occurred, Anupada Sutta. Dhamma talks on the Anupada Sutta. This provides a highly detailed account of the progression through the Jhanas. Zen Zen Site